Hi, I am Peter B. Smith. My home is Syracuse, New York. I was born and raised in Long Island, Smithtown, no relation. And this is for you, New Yorkers. Where I am stepping back into some housekeeping. I have been a engineer in that capacity I've been called smart a speaker in that capacity I've been called articulate and a friend in that capacity I've been called loyal. On the other hand, never have I been called nice. Never have I been called a good son. And never have I been told that I'm easy to get along with. It matters because what you hear from others tends to be the way you're seen. It's usually accurate if you hear enough people say something in the opinion of the world. So that's who I am. And that's from the perspective of other people. And tonight is maybe from my own perspective. Tonight, there's some equipment here. Tonight, behind me is my car shining a light on me. It's past midnight. And off to the side there, there's some, there's some more workout equipment over there. And there's a broom. Tonight, all this litter behind me, my intention is for it to be swept up. All of this is happening in an undisclosed location in Las Vegas. My friends and I come here to work out. I've been here a few hours now, and I have a few hours to go. So, what better means than by recording myself in what might be considered as natural a habitat as I inhabit to share for the one and only time the world from my perspective. Now, I thought I could say something that might speak to a part of the work that I do, which is in software, engineering, the web. Software engineering, the web. Taking a historical point and discussing how Yahoo came to be, how Google came to be, and where we are today with all of what generative tools like GPT are capable of and not. It's worth noting in between that conversation might be certain things around the video here, me doing hip thrusts or brooming, and it's worth noting that's all very much a part of my life. It's worth noting up ahead may be some things about the world of sex and sex workers, and I'm here in Las Vegas. 
that's a part of this world, and those are my friends. So, with all that housekeeping, down to the only things I can think to talk about. Yahoo got started as a manually managed guide to the internet. It was links curated by people, categorized, such as cooking and fashion and working out by people, one by one by one, put onto a home page and given to the world to explore what was the burgeoning World Wide Web. It was manual to start. It matters that it was manual to start. People did the categorization. They sat in a room, and a lot of folks go to stories about you know, the popular culture has said, well, did you know there's a time when humans were computers? That was a job title, that the people who were calculating what it was to develop the atom bomb in a scientific way had. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I don't know what that has to do with my lifetime. In my lifetime, computers were and are digital and operated by humans. Fine. The manual process became slightly less manual. Two men, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, come up with something that makes that manual categorization and that presentation of the home page, which is also manually done, obsolete. They did it with math. There's a concept homophily. That is the concept of page rank, the very first and very powerful algorithm behind Google. Whether it was named after Larry Page or who was with it ranked pages is really not, except for to Larry and Sergey, meaningful. What's meaningful is what does it operate under the premise of. It's that on the web, a link to a page and site is a meaningful indicator that people want to go to it. Humans that are operating computers are creating web pages. And I am creating a web page for baking cinnamon buns. 
and my friend is operating a web page for baking chocolate cake. I link to the friend of mine with the chocolate cake page, and so do many others. Ten of us do it. So typing into Google chocolate cake, because there are ten links to the chocolate cake, chocolate cake page, it gets ranked higher than the one with three. There is more to it than that, and that that is network theory, graph theory, and homophily. This idea that birds of a feather flock together means that those pages, those birds with the biggest flock must be humanly meaningful. Google made a few billion dollars on that insight. They were able to determine relevance. What is relevant? Applied elsewhere, shopping. Amazon did, here's what you might like, here's what others who viewed this also viewed. That same concept where we are doing weights in order to index and search across all the pages on the World Wide Web, applied to shopping and the very similar result, another billion dollar company is born. That idea and insight out of Google and the broader builders of the World Wide Web made sense. Dollars too. It was people driven. It was the people that were linking to the pages. It was the activity of the people that were buying items that built all of the connections. The activity of all the humanity was being, is being today compiled and made in a simple format accessible by way of portals, Google being one of them, Amazon being another. After those two, Facebook came along. It's been said that the key idea of Facebook had been invented prior to it. And it's been said that the thing that changed was the price of uploading a photo went down. Prior to Facebook, the cost of photo sharing was higher than when Facebook did what it did. You take all the pages on the internet, you look at the 
relevance of any of them based on birds of a feather flocking together, you get Google. When you take the same concept applied to people purchasing items, you get Amazon. Now you get the concept applied to what uh, relationship looks like when a human activity is processed by that same algorithm. What happens to create your feed? In the beginning is some ranking to determine relevance. And these all become the core of the three companies that today are very entrenched behind the scenes for the entire of the World Wide Web and beyond that, the internet. Draw a distinction where the web is the software and the internet is the hardware and you've got yourself some clarity over what the internet is. The internet is the hardware. It's those boxes. It is the wires and all of the connections in the physical world, the internet. The World Wide Web is a software product that we consume in web browsers and elsewhere. We start with Yahoo, manually categorizing because people are pressing the buttons and saying what category anything goes into. We get to Google that is extending the categorization by way of math. Google and Amazon apply to search and shopping. Facebook later, when the price of photo sharing is reduced, is able to apply that in a compelling way for social relationships. On the back of affordable images to go around all of that text, we have a social network that is compelling. All right. Today, GPT, what is it? We're talking about it differently as a society than we did blockchain. The reason there's no ideology tied to it. There's no ideology of Amazon. They don't stand for anything, nor does Google, nor Facebook. The men who started them compellingly tell the story that if it's Google, we don't want to be evil, and if we're Amazon, we want to make things affordable, be the world store, and if we're Facebook, we say that we're all about connecting people. 
none of that's true, really. At the end of the day, all those were started by geeks that were pressing buttons on computers and uh, geeks that were typing in numbers into spreadsheets that had no compelling ideology behind it. They're technical. Blockchain, a bit different in the sense that there is an ideology that money needs a new maker. And that maker is not the public. It is the private. And that ideology is a very worthy consideration on a philosophical grounds when it is compelling as a feasible accomplishment for the whole world by way of technological means. Blockchain has that ideology, whether you talk about it as Bitcoin and the financial world or of Ethereum in the more technical distributed computing sense, it's there that the private has a compelling means of taking on what is otherwise public. Now, because that happened as a national conversation in the past couple of years, and AI is happening right now in a new way, the comparison is made that AI is a new blockchain, that Sam Altman is the new Sam Bankman Freed. That it's all overblown in the same way that blockchain had its moment of peak, AI will as well, and then its decline, and then it's fading to the background. There's no ideology to GPT. For starters with Yahoo, we had people by hand doing their opinion and their curation on their individual brains. We had a collective of people whose links were then computed to become Google's power. So, know this with GPT. Those concepts remain. There are a thousand million monkeys that happen to be homo sapien humans at typewriters and what they're doing is making connections in the act called data labeling. There are many of them. They are contractors in countries that are not mine here in America. Sometimes they are, at all told, the bulk of them are not. It's just too much money out the door. So it's usually Kenya's and Costa Rica's, just anywhere not US based for price reasons. So with those data labelers labeling, there also has to be something beyond that power in GPT. And it is stated a few years ago in a research paper, the unreasonable effectiveness of character level transforms. Character level meaning A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. And transforms being the T of GPT, transformers. Take for a moment, Google making a link. I put up cinnamon buns, John puts up chocolate cake. I go make my link. What Google knows about is the page as a whole has relevance. What it does not know, except for by way of other links, is all of the depth of what's in there. There's something more to it when you know about the depth of all of what's in there. If a character is a single layer, 
a letter, a token is a part of a word. Two or three letters, four letters. You don't need to know what the difference between one token and another is. You know the difference between a letter and a word. A couple of the tokens make up a word, and you know now the size and granularity of what GPT is working with. And it's people doing the data labeling that are giving the raw material of what the algorithm requires to then output words, sentences, paragraphs. Paragraphs are the results, not lists of links. The outputs appear to be formatted in the way that any among us may have, in our high school years, been educated on called essays, beginnings and middles and ends. Now, I was at a bar considering what it would mean, what if the senators who had Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, who had a, a nameless sycophant and a drone out of IBM, and had a professor 
out of, I'll say, Columbia University, somewhere in New York, in front of them. But the whole of that body, our governors of federal democracy, wanted to know is can this kill us? What about steal from us? Can it harm our children? Can it kill us? Could we make one of these generative AI algorithms pick a target to then murder a citizen? Or pick a target and kill an adversary of our country? And the CEO of OpenAI says, yeah. And in this context, wow, does that seem like a scary facet of generative AI? Can it steal from us? Some of these generative AIs have taken the textual approach. Some of them have taken an audio approach. And you can get some Garth Brooks sounding songs made by one of these by saying, give me a song that sounds like Garth Brooks. Now, in order for that to work, that means that this algorithm has to have as an input data about Garth Brooks songs. And when you understand that it's data labelers, there were humans involved in the process saying this is a Garth Brooks, Garth Brooks song. It is humans that make that initial link, Garth Brooks to these waveforms of audio. So the harm our children part. These public ones, in particular, the one made by OpenAI and ChatGPT is its name, are censored against anything sex-oriented across the board. The CEO had shared, we don't believe there's anything inherent in adult content that has to be censored, only that 13-year-olds use our service and we do not want their eyes to be on that as a result of us presenting it. It's a valid stance, isn't it? So, so, so. Will the bots of the future get better at killing? It seems to me the other team is going to have bots too, and it'll be humans that are programming bots, and it will be the humans that are the determining factor in the wars to come. Seems to me in music, people have been robbed all of the history of audio. As soon as it could be recorded and sold or recorded and freely shared, there have been thoughts of musicians getting robbed. And today, musicians make money. Not all of the time and they do get robbed. Finally, children on the internet like porn, 13 year olds especially. So whether ChatGPT is censored or not, whether it pays royalties to musicians or not, and whether it kills citizens and enemies alike or not, is determined by the decisions of humans. Those were our senators' concerns, and they need to speak the voice of the nation, and they have to speak to the most broad audience when they're on television. So you can pick those three great topics, because who doesn't have some thought about their family at war or their family being policed? Who does not have a thought about music, the most universal of all entertainments. Who does not have a thought about children? We've all been them.
All right. I'm not a nation, and my concerns are not the same. My concern, one, I was at that bar considering AI, and I was doing it because I had been in a role play chat room that's capable of connecting men and women on the internet to each other for any chat fantasy that any of them care to engage in. One of them wants to be a monster and say that they are decapitating the other person. The other person says, look, if you are gonna decapitate me, please just put my head back on. And there is a good time in entertaining each other by way of text. It's a straightforward thing to do. Your imagination and mine are both capable of figuring and calculating and describing and all of what we're capable of can be fun and enjoyable. We can have a text-based sex chat. We can say that we're having a fun, romantic evening at a bar. We can say we got from that bar to our beds and we woke up the next day agreeing we never want to see each other again. Take care. As we please, as internet citizens, we can do that anonymously. And differently today with generative it's clear based on my own experience that a AI chatbot is not the same experience creatively as a human. And I just described the scenario that I was in last night in one of these chat rooms where the writer on the other side had said, oh, I'm gonna take your head off. And I just said, please put it back on. I'd really like to keep it. There's a certain nicety when it's the other human that in that same web service and that same list of names on the side has a few AI chatbots and in my typing to them they basically gave me back what I said in an affirmative way. It couldn't go uh, A to C, it just went A to B. It was a very direct response to every point that I made. Fine. Maybe it gets better as a respondent over time. And not for nothing, I enjoy the responses of today's 22, 23, 2023 chatbots in a way that I did not in 2003. When it was Smarter Child on AIM, it could give factual data. And when it's the AI chatbot of the anime Neon Genesis Evangelion, the Asura character, and it's that one, and it's got like the personality of this anime character, that's pretty cool. Because I know that the way that it got that is based on a human describing the character, and then this response comes out as if it were. I'm at the bar considering these things, talking to the woman next to me about sex toys. What if you had your internet connected sex toy and it was some way controlled by an AI? She shared that she had an internet connected sex toy and that she had a partner who had control on it. In the sense of pressing the buttons, she was okay with that. She also had the relationship with the partner to eventually decide, I've had enough. Or to, in the moment, describe, I don't want it this way, I want it that way. And isn't that fun? That's a great way to have a long distance relationship as far as I'm concerned. Good on them for doing it. And so my question raised in my mind, a 
concept pioneered by a man named Kenneth Burke, which is described by him in a pentad, a five-pointed interconnected graph of concepts. Purpose, actor, action, setting, and agency. These five concepts, purpose being why we're here, actor being who is here, agency being about decision making, setting being where we're at, and the action being what we're doing. If we look at any dramatic situation, and we can look at all of life as a drama, then we can look at what AI has in its role in the human drama. Yahoo, Google, and Amazon could have been by design based on computational capabilities of the time highly active in a way that reality did not bear out. No stopping any engineer on the planet from making a search box that says, bring me to the best Chinese food nearby, and then return a map directly to a Chinese restaurant that is in some way the number one ranking. That feature existed in some way in Google's earliest days as the I'm feeling lucky button. It just gives you the number one result. It had to be described as I'm feeling lucky because of the reality that it might not be accurate. And if it were, it would be by luck. If that became the default mechanism, then in that dramatic pentad, we might be looking differently at the role of the technology. If it were that you typed into Google and you went right to the top result by today, we would be thinking about it differently. And it didn't go that way. 
And while the technology was there to just give you the first result, nobody wanted it. In the reality, we wanted 10 links. We wanted choice. We collectively enjoy choice. I do. I enjoy providing choices. I love receiving choices. And receiving a few links to then go, this Chinese restaurant, but you know what? Tom said that that one's no good. Uh, you know what? Kelsey said this one's great. Never mind that it's the seventh one. I want to go to the one that Kelsey said. Nice reminder, Google. Kind of you to provide me that bit of feedback that I needed to make my own choice. Boom. Done. Chinese restaurant. Hey, Kelsey, that was a great restaurant. Nice. You were right. And you send that text, and you have just a brief interaction with Google, and then a nice interaction with your friend. So we didn't want agency in Google. We didn't want it to make the choice for us. Out of all the pages on the internet, what do we want it to do? We just want it to be an assistant giving us relevant choices that humans have said are relevant. Humans have said the Google choices are relevant based on that birds of a feather flocking together, links, linking, great. Now, today, we continue to want agency. We do not want our AIs to control our sex toys. Not really, like, in the sense of just making the choice. I think I learned it from the woman I was discussing it with, and as I look at the decision, it seems to me human to want choice in your pleasure. Can it have a different role? If it's AI Asuda, the neon Genesis Evangelion character, in a text-based chat, that's an agent. That is an actor. That is a party to the experience in our perception of what it means to be engaged in a text chat. It appears there is this agent on the other side, Asuda, that is responding in some way to our messages. So it could be an agent, and that's all right. Purpose. Imagine it's a Dungeons and Dragons game, and there's some desire to have a neutral party determine the point of the adventure. We're there to slay a dragon, etc. 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 It could set up a purpose based on a human stating, hello, chat GPT, AI chatbot, you are a dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons. Please just pick a scenario. We'll let you know if we want it to be better or different and otherwise set us up. It's time for us to get started. And the response comes and given that it's been trained down to the sub word level, the token level, it can understand nothing, but it can provide the semblance of understanding and give us as Dungeons and Dragons parties a purpose. Setting. In a dramatic scenario, is a literal meaning. In the setting of me at my computer typing to a uh, chatbot, it's me at my computer. It's, I'm behind the keyboard. In the setting of AI sex toy, it is bed. And there is no typing in that sense. It's uh, controlled by uh, it's any number of factors. Can be controlled by audio, buttons on a iPhone screen, novel, 
controllers like the acceleration of the vehicle you're in make for a different type of experience but all the same the setting is as varied as any technology and that means there are settings that AI does not have a place in our world church in the audience is a place to shut your phone off when someone is looking you in the eye in business and they take their phone out they appear to be someone you may choose not to do business with again depending on your circumstance and that is mine I will not be doing business with you long if I am looking at the back of your Xiaomi Nord phone And of course, Xiaomi makes the Mi, and OnePlus makes the Nord. And I know the difference. And the generative AI may well not. And it would make up and present as real without its own clarification as I did just then so in that pentad you might want your own agency your own decision making capability maybe okay with an opposite agent may be okay with that agent giving purpose to the interaction in a certain way the setting might be outside the totality of all of human existence and may well remain in the same bounds as technology does today action is our final piece and his action that threatens a computer taking an action is a frightening thought when computers are inside of guns and those guns are not given any oversight those guns are just out there in the world. So let's look at the lead up to violence and computers. You don't have to look too far than New York. You can go to New Jersey, which had a few bad cities adopt some systems that were deployed within the worst parts of the computers, databases, ranking of neighborhoods. Those that were ranked the worst got sound detectors and other visual detectors that then were deployed in the hope, earnest hope of the police officers deploying them they would be useful tools in the reduction of murder and other violent crime. And in reality, not so much. In reality, those places were poor. Their police were trained on drug arrests and their police were no more or less capable after the computers got involved. The computers were not armed like the police officers were. 
Can you think of a single instance of a police officer's computer killing anybody? I cannot. I can think of a human-controlled robot that had a bomb attached. Pardon me. How did that work? There was a sniper in a tower that might have had a bomb. I think it was in Texas. I got to think back on that as a reference and leave it like this. We've had computers capable of shooting guns. We've had massive deployments citywide of technology in order to reduce violence. And the society has decided to not give the trigger to the computer. We fear it because of its technical feasibility and we have, I have, such grand opposition to it that I do not need in day-to-day -day life to state it as an opinion. It is a shared, quiet opinion that my belief holds across other humans with brains. In that pentad, it appears agents that can possibly set purposes, those are the roles for generative AI. This place here was first shown to me by Cy Monster. Cy Monster brought his girlfriend to our retreat. And his girlfriend is Molly Stewart. As I'm over the other day, say, Molly, there is, in my understanding, and borne out by the internet, a sex toy modeled after your vagina. And it's connected to the internet. So, do you think there's a place for AI in the world of sex? Molly Stewart said some of her colleagues are working with it, and there's some of the work that's touching on it, and it seems niche. niche. I 
said a few days before to Cy Monster. What do you think about AI on calisthenics? Uh, it's not there, was his response. This man and this woman are as good at what they do as anyone is at anything in any profession. His profession is being strong. Her profession is being sexy. Those are human, human, human professions. The whole profession is be a strong man. Be a strong man and you are Cy Monster if you can do it as skillfully as he does. Be a sexy woman and you are Molly Stewart if you can be as sexy as she is. So, AI, go be strong, go be sexy. Those aren't exactly prompts that can be fulfilled by today's technology. Those professions are safe. Are all professions safe? Farmers were not safe. As a population, the amount of farmers in our country are a minority of a minority's minority, 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 minority. I don't know what the number is. Who knows? How many farmers do I know? I'm here in a concrete wasteland. I'm in a desert that is so hot during the day, I work nights. And I do not know a farmer. I just buy the groceries as if I'm in New York from the shop, the same stuff we people hate looking at ourselves as being incapable. We like to think of ourselves, certainly I do, as capable of anything and choosing not to do it. I am a capable, able-bodied farmer. If only I were in a world that seemed important. It does not seem important because machines do it so well. So some professions are at risk to technology. Farming is one of them. I expect as a result of ChatGPT, there will be fewer farmers. So just model what that might look like. There are farm tasks that involve precision. Precision in identification, precision in dexterity and nimbleness of fingertips. I believe in no small way that any generative AI is capable of producing data that guides and maybe meaningfully as well of ingesting data that guides robotic agents to pick some food. I'm not worried about the farmers. My grandfather was a farmer. He did everything that he could to stop. Moved to New York, met my grandmother. They raised five children, one of them my father. None of those five children did any farming. 
What other professions? What other professions does nobody do? How about the grocery worker? Does the cashier get replaced? Think about it this way. In my life, there are places where the entirety of the shopping experience is human. This jacket is bought from a store called Montler. And I buy it because it fits. I spend a lifetime buying clothing that doesn't fit. And then I make money. And somebody tells me, you need to spend $1,000 on a jacket in order for it to fit. In order for me to have a fitting jacket, I will pay that money. I will not sit there with it in my hand while checking myself out at the register. No, I will not. It's just too many dollars going out of my hand and too possible for somebody to get paid enough dollars for me to consult with to be sure that I've got the jacket that is going to be worth it after I've bought it. Because after I bought it, it will not be worth $1,000. It'll be worth half of that at best. So I gotta love it when I buy it. I gotta have somebody there to convince me to love it or otherwise remind me of all of the reasons that this jacket and not some other jacket is the one for me to buy today. On the other part of my day, I shop at a Walmart and insist on whether I'm buying a handful of items or one item going to the human checkout. I am not the common buyer. I am one of three on a checkout line and the rest of the buyers are at the self-checkout. And mind you, when I'm there early or late and there are no other options, I go to that self-checkout too. Is the cashier profession in danger from any generative AI? <laughs> Depends on what you're buying. If some type of computer was a part of the response to my input of scanned items, I'm okay with that. If at checkout I am scanning item after item after item by barcode stating to that computer the items that I'm buying and by implicit association to what I desire, that computer generates some response better than just here's some similar items, something that states based on all of these inputs and everything that the entire world has ever said, and based on this particular store's marketing department, here is some good music to listen to while you eat. I'd be fine with that. It might be silly, it might not be accurate, it might be just a suggestion and I would be fine with reading it or if it's an audio one hearing it no bother just treat it like everything else in life
somebody trying to sell me something, and I do love being sold. So I welcome generative AI at the checkout. I welcome it with open arms at Moncler where I make a number of purchases in a lifetime and after a lifetime of purchases and a lifelong relationship with the salesman at the shop, that salesman is looking at the computer that's saying, your customer here has been buying all of this and that combined with everything that the world knows and that combined with what the sales department has as its mission Here is a 3D printed gift. It costs more to 3D print something. This jacket costs more than a box of cereal. A box of cereal usually comes with 50 cents off your next purchase. Some jacket like this, if it came with a 3D printed bracelet to complement it, what the heck? I have no problem with a generative AI coming up with a very specific gift for me. I might think it's silly and throw it away. Yeah, generative AI is going to get involved in professions. Those that are dying out, like farming, will probably continue to die out. Those that are growing, like software engineering, will continue to grow. What specific changes happen? Well, in the rhetorical Berkian Pentad, some AI agents, okay, nobody wants to deal with one until they want to have an affordable flight, and when they want a low price flight, they don't mind going through some type of robot listener 
to get them to the right department to do the initial sort, to get that little bit of feedback on when their flight is, when they make a phone call, when they engage in an app or any of the other myriad of things that are deployed by airlines to keep the price of a flight low. A generative AI agent has a fine role there. In dealing with purpose, dependent on the scenario, an AI may generate some purpose. An AI cannot be strong, it cannot be Psy Monster, it cannot be sexy, it cannot be Molly Stewart. The creative industries appear to be embracing AI with open arms. The concern about Garth Brooks was not voiced by Garth Brooks, it was voiced by a senator from Tennessee whose constituency is Nashville, whose constituency owns the rights to Garth Brooks' music. So the creativity enhancement of generative AI may be a problem for the music business. It may change what gets sold, how it gets sold, where it gets sold, to who it gets displayed to, Boy, oh boy, I would not want to be in Nashville dealing with this. And at the same time, I didn't want to be dealing with it before generative AI. Moving to the work that I believe has a meaningful earthquake of an effect. The work that I believe has an earthquake of an effect is all about categorization and presentation of real nouns. People, places, things, ideas. The categorization of nouns is as abstract a notion of what I do as any I have ever said out loud. Now, how does that affect my job? Rather than collecting from Yelp.com's data source, rather than collecting from any number of, in a more internal tool world, legal databases, as pre-categorized by the collective of the internet, of those reviewers on Yelp, or the collective of an individual law firm, of those lawyers and case managers and all of those roles in between. I am now looking at data labelers as the team. The way data is categorized changes now. The specificity becomes tighter. Wow, wow, wow. Part of me, I'll curb my enthusiasm. You can see that I'm jumping off of this box. So, allow me 
this moment of mere nonchalance of a blasé attitude towards generative pre-trained transformers. All that changes in my job is categorization is more specific to achieve a better response. Rather than Yelp taking in reviews to restaurants and then returning a response to me, an engineer, I am tasked with, for my customers of services and my customers of products, delivering specific responses and as I grow my company that means that all of us are now in the business of introducing specificity related to nouns, to people, places, and things. And our products must be extensions of the entire world and reductions to a single man, woman, or child on a device. Our products must encompass all of that data being labeled by the world, and in particular, the raw data sets, as well as the very specific data of the man, woman, or child working behind the screen in a participatory way for an organization our products must be able to ingest all of that as an organization our people must be able to label all of that and as I sit here much like farming, I'm capable of it, but I just as soon not do it. So I must find those who would. Those who would may well be within the organizations that I serve for my service customers. Those data labelers may be right there in the law firm. Those case workers are no longer using computers to be mere connectors of links and pages, they may be using computers to be connectors of sub-word level specific words, concepts, images, representations of people, places, and things. To put a point on it, let's talk about a fictitious law firm. We'll call it Tangy Law. And Mr. Tangy has been in the business of saving accident victims from financial ruin by providing a free service his legal expertise 
and in the case that he is successful in preventing financial ruin, in the case that he is successful in bringing a case against an insurance company, against a culpable opposing party, and then receive for his customer a substantial payment that can be used for all of the medical bills that are part and parcel of a automobile accident, he gets paid. Been pretty good at that. Mr. Tangy has a law firm now that has 50 people. There are a bunch of other lawyers that provide that same service as he does. They just don't want to deal with all the hassle of business that goes on around it. They just want the accident victim assigned to them rather than go find the victim or have marketing that then tells the victims that they're out there. He, they just, okay. But then you get the caseworkers that deal with the very first moments after the accident before it's really clear are they even plausibly able to prevent financial ruin. Were they drunk at the time? Yeah, bozo, you probably going to be ruined financially by the accident because you were doing something illegal at the time. If ever there was a reason not to drink and drive, it was to prevent financial ruin. Caseworkers, lawyers, those two roles, and me, software engineer. In 2020, my job is for that customer to create a better tool for extracting data from PDFs and then categorizing the address from that PDF into an address field. And that is a place in our list of nouns. My job is using a computer to make sure that that place is real. So I have to look at the collective of what is provided by the USPS, bing it off of their deal and say, is this real? And then I get back a yes. In 2020, I think that, that describes the bulk of my work, was collecting data for a firm like Mr. Tangy's and extracting it and categorizing it from myriads of sources, primarily documents, primarily PDFs, and extracting word level content to then be verified against some known source like the USPS and ultimately at the end of the day, Mr. Tangy is capable of, when that accident victim comes with a bunch of stuff from a doctor and a bunch of stuff from elsewhere, being categorized for the purposes of figuring financial ruin and preventing it. 2023, same law firm, Mr. Tangy, same accident victim, same documents, and me. Now, that ingest that I'm asked to do has to be more specific because the competitors also have brains and the opposing party also applies it to prevent financial responsibility. The responsible party financially might be an insurer. It's not ruin for them. It's not ruin. The person on the other side as an automaton has a, mm, what is it, what's the good, a mindless bozo. Just has to push some papers and make sure that his role in the major insurance business is satisfied. And as long as he does and his colleague she does and they all do, then on average financial ruin is prevented they have a major resource 
in breadth, the action of the victim has a major resource in depth. Mr. Tangy is applying all of his brain power to many fewer cases, and that depth is what I aid in in 2023. Across all of the documents provided by this accident victim and all the world of legal knowledge that is now being labeled by great companies in the legal industry in greater specificity, what can be done to prevent financial ruin? Can we pull together concepts from the whole public of case law and match those concepts in a sub-word level to concepts that are embedded in the PDF documents. If only I could pull the, not just address in 2020, I could also pull all of the doctor's notes and make meaning from that. That connects to all of the doctor's notes that have ever been shown in public. I might be able to categorize in a better way, where these notes fit into the category of malpractice on the part of the doctor. And maybe they're the ones we're going to go for to get paid. And good thing that the doctor has insurance. And it goes in another direction. We've got that accident victim's police report. And we've got a whole list of public police reports. And in this police report, at a sub-word level, at a very specific way, we can come up with a new category. And we can say, a job well done. Crumble it up. Police did his job. What good is that? Can't sue them. Our accident victim was alert and sober and took some video after the accident of their very drunken opposing party. And that video is now ingested. And we can extract, not text from that video, but what we can extract from that video are sounds. And we've got a whole library of other accident sounds. And that person is slurring their words in a way that appears categorically to be consistent with a bunch of convicted drunk drivers. So their clean record as a driver up until that point is pretty good as a document that in their case can support their sobriety. But our clever accident victim took in all of the noise and that noise sounds a bunch like a bunch of other drunks. And now Mr. Tangy can apply the depth of his focus to being down a path given that that generative category has been descriptive of categorically drunk. And you can go and vet it out. What does the rest of that opposing party's night look like? Do a little bit of on the ground research and well, yeah, they were at a bar beforehand. Duh, they were drunk. Okay, so move on today to more specificity in the ingest, better categorization of people, places, and things and you get the boredom that I have. I don't care about any of that. I really don't.
So what does matter to me? What matters to me is improving at my job. And my job is to serve the world. And when that world is the world of Tangy Law Firm, then I do care about that accident victim. I do care about their financial ruin. I do care about that caseworker. I do care about that legal team. So I want them to do what they do better than anyone. I want to do what I do better than anyone. And if what I do is categorize nouns, I want those categories to be accurate. I want those nouns to be numerous. And I want them presented to all the people involved that are my people in a way that is advantageous. That is better than what the opposing party uh, is capable of. That is cost effective. That is simple. That, that matters to me. Being better at my job so that others can be better at theirs, and not any others, only the mine, my people. Cy Monster and Molly Stewart. They came to New York autumn of 2021. They came and discussed how does artificial intelligence operate in the world of strength calisthenics, gymnastics, and that was 2021. In 2023, what's changed? At the time, I didn't know Molly Stewart in any meaningful way. So, not knowing Molly Stewart in any meaningful way while she's there talking strength. Since 2023, I've grown to trust. She's all right. I trust that when she says she needs something like a uh, dog sitter, she can really needs it, and I'll be there to do some dog sitting. And she has really cute corgis, which makes it easy.
so with that new level of trust, what's changed is my friendship with sex workers. And all of what I had been thinking about, about strength, is now how can a sex worker make more money? It's, it's just my people. Well, somebody who's been recorded having sex is making all sorts of noises, and those noises can be categorized, and then those noises can be synced with a sex toy to then be fun. Cool. Noise based is one more control. So that when some woman somewhere out there is looking to have her own orgasm and is making noises like Molly Stewart, well, that sex toy will open the floodgates. Great. I'm glad to be of service. Strength, Cy Monster, comes to New York to talk about strength and AI, and at the time, the description of the task is, look at the video and put a line on it. Got there faster than expected, and it was all of what was around it that was not good, meaning, it's possible to identify a straight line of a human body based on knowing where these major joints are, the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, and connecting a line. Specificity. Can we be specific to the forearm and the bicep? Assuming we can, then we can get a five-point connection rather than a three-point connection, and that line becomes more accurate. That line matters in a handstand because the line is aesthetically pleasing and anatomically effective. The longer you want to hold the handstand, the better your line needs to be especially when trying to do it longer than the person next to you. If your friend has a straighter line than you, they have an anatomical advantage based on gravity, based on lever arms. And for a science lesson, here's one for you. The height of a human is a meaningful part of relative to body weight strength. The lesser the height, the greater the strength relative to their body weight. And that is because height, depth, and breadth, one, two, three, are used multiplicatively and that product is the volume of the human body. And from that volume, one meaningful measure, the size of a person. Another meaningful measure, the cross-sectional area of a muscle. Look at that. That right there is the diameter of my bicep and the area. That, if we make it a square, is a length and the width. And that's a square relationship. And then the volume is a cubic relationship. And as you grow in height, your cube grows in a cubic scale. As you grow in height, you are growing at a rate that's faster than the diameter of your bicep. 
So that ratio of volume to your diameter of any muscle, not just your bicep, is more spread. As you go lesser in height, your bicep with its cube to square proportionality is a less dramatic proportion. And when I'm saying this, I'm talking about specific concepts that provide meaning to those who care to be stronger in a very, very broad sense. Generative AI has a role to play. All the world of knowledge about being strong is contained in research papers and documents. All that can now be ingested. All those research papers from every sports medicine paper ever that describe things like allometric scaling relationships can be ingested at a subword level and all of the questions anybody has about strength can then be categorized. Those generated categories can point to certain ideas and may have otherwise be locked up in research papers that no one links to. Because nobody likes to read research papers. People like cinnamon buns and chocolate cake. So you got plenty of, plenty of, plenty of credible options for cinnamon buns and chocolate cake, and they're very discoverable because people put them on the internet. The research papers go into PDFs, they go into archives, they go into journals of sports medicine that are so niche that they must be paid for. Fine. Our strength AI can take in some text and respond with some categorization and give anyone looking to be strong some hope because they know at five foot whatever I am, and I am just basically talking about myself, that I can someday be as strong as Psy Monster when he was 18. I might get there by 40 because I am shorter than Psy Monster. I have an advantage relative to my body weight in size, in strength. And what we like to do Big things come in small packages. And big packages come in small thing, things. Uh, huh. Isn't that good? We get our strength-based AI based on text research papers. We combine that with greater specificity in knowing where the joints are take our text, we take our images and videos, plonk them together, we've got a saleable product that's better than what was available and possible in 2021. We collect all the audio from all of the orgasms of all of the Molly Stewarts of the world and we put that into some type of algorithm and then we take the very specific noises that are being emitted by a female or male using an internet-connected sex toy, 
and then that toy becomes an agent in a different way. Whoa. This has been my life out here in Las Vegas. Bye.